Welcome, everybody. My name is Rick Houlihan. I'm the worldwide technical leader for NoSQL Services at AWS. Uh, thank you for taking the time out of your day to come see this session on DynamoDB. Uh, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about DynamoDB advanced design patterns and, and NoSQL data modeling. And that's that's really the focus of my presentations for those of you who are familiar. Um, the first thing I always like to do is talk to a brief history of data processing. You know, why are we using NoSQL? Uh, what is this new technology? Uh, and then we're going to get into a bit of how does it work, right? And really, that's what the meat of this session is going to be about. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit uh, about uh, denormalized versus normalized schema, uh, what it means <coughs> uh, to model your data, uh, you know, for your access patterns, uh, and why NoSQL is a technology that is actually, you know, the wave of the future uh, is what, you know, as I think. Uh, we're going to get into Amazon DynamoDB and how it plays in the serverless ecosystem. And we're going to talk about modeling for real world applications, right? We're not going to stop at just talking about theoretical. We're going to actually take it down into a, a real world service uh, that we, you know, to, that, that manages, com that needs complex access patterns. Uh, all right. So the first thing we like to talk about is the history of data processing, right? Uh, history repeats itself because nobody was listening the first time. And that's never been more true in the era of uh, modern data processing. <laughs> uh, you know, data processing today is all in the history of data processing is really about uh, a series of peaks and valleys and what I call data pressure. Uh, data pressure is the ability of the system to manage the amount of data that I'm asking it to process at a reasonable cost or a reasonable time, right? When one of those dimensions is broken, that's a technology trigger. And typically that's when we're going to go ahead and start inventing things. And we've invented many things over the years, right? The first database we had was a great white database. It's the one between our ears. We're all born with it, highly available, uh, questionable durability, you know, zero fault tolerance, single user system, right? You're not going to build an enterprise database service off of that. And so we started doing something different, right? We invented the uh, ledger accounting, a system of being able to write things down to store structured data. That is the definition of a database. This powered, you know, public and private sector services for uh, millennia until the 1880 U.S census came along, right? Herman Hollerith was tasked with processing that data. It took him eight years of that 10 year cycle. And all of a sudden he had to invent something to make that happen uh, for the next 10 years for the next census cycle. That was the machine readable punch card and the punch card sorting machine, right? The era of modern data processing is born. Rapidly, we start to consume this data in ways that he'd never anticipated when these inventions were made, right? We start to enhance and, and evolve and iterate and invent many, many new technologies, paper tape, magnetic tape, distributed block storage, hierarchical database systems. And around the 1970s, we invented this neat thing. A guy came at, named Edgar Codd came along, and his mission in life was to build a system that allowed people to ask questions of the data without understanding how to write code. And a lot of people didn't think that Edgar Codd would ever be able to do this because the cost of the CPU was so expensive and the cost of the storage <laughs> relatively compared was so cheap and that, you know, the reality was storage was getting cheaper even at the time. Well, this little thing called Moore's Law was, you know, helped Edgar Codd make that happen. It balanced that equation of that cost of storage versus CPU until around 2014. We'll talk about that in a second. When things started slowing down, right? Moore's Law started breaking. And now in the era of big data, we're starting to look at time complexity of these queries in the relational database and understanding that it's actually better to start structuring your data in ways that the application uses it. We'll talk about what that means when we get into the data modeling. But we need to understand that Moore's law is no longer an enabler for the relational database, right? CPU performance is flattening. This has never been more apparent than it is in the high performance computing sector. We've seen the annual performance increase of the top 500 computing clusters globally decrease significantly since 2004 below that line of Moore's law, right? Moore's law tells us how things are going to increase in you know, CPU performance will increase over time, but we're not making that bar. And the reason why is because guess what? There's an absolute minimum when it comes to gate length on a CPU on a piece of silicon. It's called zero. However, the storage costs are going to continue to drop. We're going to talk about bigger and bigger units, dollars per gigabyte, dollars per petabyte, dollars per terabyte. It's not going to be, there's, there's, no, there's always dimensions we can move up when we talk about the cost of storage, right? So with CPU performance flattening, storage costs dropping, the average application becoming a big data application, the answer is not increasing the time complexity of your queries, right? It's decreasing it. And this is where we get into NoSQL. And it's really not new thinking, right? Edgar Codd himself recognized this in his seminal paper on relational data modeling, right? This is the father of the, of, of the relational data model. 
most people might say he's the father of the data model. And when he talks about normalization, right, he talks about how it being an advantage for storage, an advantage for communication of bulk data between systems because it's deduplicating the data. And on denormalization, how, you know, introducing those strong redundancies into the stored set will increase the storage capacity consumed <coughs> and add complexity to the update time. However, it will drop the query time and, and uh, reduce the load on the central processing unit. So even Edgar Codd himself knew that this was the equation, right? We're trading storage for CPU to make this happen. And again, that worked until we got into, you know, 2014 and Moore's Law starting to fall off the, the predicted curve, right? So what it comes down to now is when does it make sense, right? What application workloads make sense for NoSQL? What makes sense for SQL? Reality is that no matter what you look at, there's some set of workloads that are never going to fit in a NoSQL database. And those are the workloads that require the ad hoc queries. If I don't understand the access patterns, if I need to support a system where a user can come in and ask questions of the data without understanding how to write code, this is Edgar Codd's mission, right? If that is the nature of the workload, then a relational database makes the most sense because it's agnostic to every access pattern, right? It's optimized for none. It's going to, the time complexity of a relational join is, ex is extremely expensive. No SQL databases, on the other hand, they act as a collection of objects stored on a single in a single table, an indexed object collection. And in essence, the queries become index scans, right? Objects that are related to each other, they live on the same index. There's no reason to join these things, but it only works, and we'll talk about this when we get into the data modeling, it really only works when I understand the access pattern very well. If the access patterns are not well understood, <clears throat> then I cannot really model the data in a NoSQL database efficiently. It's going to cost me a lot to go get the data if I need to support ad hoc queries. So what does this mean? It means that, you know, NoSQL databases are really good for OLTP apps because OLTP apps are really, they have well understood access patterns. Every time the workload runs, it asks the same questions, right? <laughs> it's not like somebody's in the back of the room at writing ad hoc queries every time someone comes in and builds a shopping cart, right? It's always the same uh, query. So that's a really good application for NoSQL. You know, SQL databases, on the other hand, they run in those applications where people need to ask questions of the data. I don't necessarily know what happened yesterday on the market. Let me query on these different dimensions and aggregate on all these different operations, you know, that you know, trading you know, operations that maybe I didn't really understand and I need to understand. You know, that's a good application for a relational database. Uh, but, you know, we're talking about two different cast classes of app, right? The OLTP app, the OLAP app. Well, you know, guess which one we write code for, right? We typically don't write a lot of code for OLAP applications. We write code for OLTP apps, right? Including that category of applications that we call operational analytics, right? If it's a well understood, you know, uh, uh, analytic that I'm looking for, that's not OLAP, right? OLAP is ad hoc query. So uh, most applications, again, we build today, OLTP fit very well in that NoSQL database, <laughs> right? So when you get into NoSQL databases, there's not a lot of differentiation between the platforms, despite what the vendors might want to tell you. Uh, really what there is is, you know, delivery services of managed NoSQL services that, that probably differentiate from roll your own. Uh, and DynamoDB differentiates in many ways from, you know, the competition. Although that a lot of our competition is moving in this direction, they don't have, you know, this type of elastic provisioning capability that we, that we, you know, uh, offer with DynamoDB. If you look at the left-hand chart here, that's kind of your legacy technology provider. This could be a relational database. You know, this could be a legacy NoSQL provider. That area under the curve, underneath that white, that, that above the blue curve and underneath the red line, that's over provision capacity. Why is it there? Well, because when you provision legacy technology, you only have one choice. You need to provision it for the peak utilization of your service. If you don't, then when the peak utilization happens, you don't have enough capacity and everyone has a bad experience. OK, on the right hand side, what you're seeing is, you know, cloud native, no SQL. <coughs> uh, and, you know, DynamoDB offers the best you know, offering here. We can get into all that, you know, you know, who's the competition and what do they offer, but not going to really go there. The reality is it's just in time provisioning of capacity, of storage, of throughput, whatever your app needs when you need it. And most of your applications, you know, they're going to run just fine in this footprint, right? You're going to see, you know, my service kind of wakes up in the morning with my customers and, you know, in the middle of the day, it's peaking. And when everyone's asleep at night, you know, it's, 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 it's you know, it, it's uh, flooring out. And I don't want to pay for throughput that I'm not using. I mean, the average enterprise application service runs at 15% CPU utilization overall. 
Uh, that's a lot of infrastructure that sits there idling, waiting for work, right? DynamoDB doesn't give you that. It gives you the ability to do just-in-time provisioning. Then we also give you on-demand capacity mode, which gives you instantaneous provisioning, right? That just-in-time, you know, we've got to kind of see the application kind of scale up. It takes 12, 15 minutes to start allocating, you know, increases to your table. On-demand, there is no wait time. If you need it, you get it, you know, from zero to a million WCUs in 0, 0.0 seconds. Uh, <clears throat> it's a little bit more expensive, and it works really well if you have spiky workloads that you can't predict, right? Then you don't have to ever provision anything. You just throw the workload at it, say go on demand mode. And I got a lot of customers that use this and save a lot of money because they don't have to have any provisioned capacity until they need it, right? Uh, so if you have those spurious spiky workloads can be a really good solution for you. DynamoDB gives you performance at any scale, uh, fast and consistent performance at any scale, but it does things that are kind of counterintuitive. You know, and you, if you manage infrastructure like, you know, especially database infrastructure, as you get to the highest levels of utilization with DynamoDB, you actually see better performance, right? And this is a use case where we drove millions of requests per table, write read load, and you're seeing the get item latency <coughs> as we approach peak utilization actually drops from that four millisecond, 3.54 millisecond range down to the low, you know, two millisecond range as as the fleet of request routers that sit in front of every DynamoDB service endpoint uh, becomes aware of your table, right? We're throwing millions of requests at you. The request router doesn't have to look up the configuration data because it has it. It's a short-lived cache that it maintains itself and it doesn't have to go back to those configuration services to get your, you know, partition locations and, you know, whatnot to know how to route your request. So it, it actually causes your request latency to drop slightly uh, because of that, you know, uh, 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 reduced hop, so to speak, as you see the traffic fall, fall off, all those short lived caches on the request routers, you know, they expire. And, you know, we start having to go back to the table on every request and looking up the configuration data. So the latency increases a little bit. But that's counterintuitive, right? As you start to push a relational database to 100% utilization, you don't see a decrease in request latency, right? You see you see things starting to go sideways. Uh, <clears throat> likewise, when you ask for more than you need, DynamoDB can sometimes give that to you if you need it. This is a great example of that. Snapchat's table, 2019 Super Bowl. I forget who was playing, but on the winning score, what you saw was enormous spike on their table in write utilization. They went into the event provisioned at 6 million, you know, write capacity, expecting that to be their peak. We always tell customers that when you're having a major event, then go ahead and provision the, the peak utilization as your floor for your auto scaling. And if you go over that, then let it adjust. But, you know, don't don't let the system try and catch up to your traffic if you know that it's coming. Right? It's kind of like the thundering herd. Uh, but in this case, they got a lot more than they thought. And they were wondering why they didn't get throttles. Well, DynamoDB takes five minutes of unused capacity and loads it up into what we call a burst bucket. So if you look at the five minutes leading up to that spike, that table was heavily underutilized. And so all of that capacity is rolling into a burst bucket and all of a sudden they needed it, we gave it to them. You try and get that from your relational database five minutes after the, after the fact, say, give me what you weren't using five minutes ago. You know, it's not gonna, it won't even respond, right? It's gonna be on the floor. Uh, DynamoDB gives you performance at any scale. Not only that, but it gives you globally distributed uh, low latency replication across regions, right? The sub, you know, one to two, uh, one to two second latency from from uh, one table to the next, you know, uh, globally distributed across multiple regions. It's the uh, most scaled out uh, global globally distributed active active no SQL technology in the world <coughs> and nothing operates at this scale. And not only that, but when you turn on global tables with DynamoDB, it's a click of a button, it's active in, in, in minutes and it's five nines availability guaranteed. Uh, that's an SLA guarantee that's maintained for you. You can see the availability of your table storage partitions in real time and know how we're, we're doing on that SLA and those service credits are automatically applied to your account. So this is our service level uh, agreement that we make with you as a customer. And I know a lot of people that respond to a lot of RFPs talking about five nines availability and they check that box. Yeah, we're five nines, we're five nines. You know what? There aren't a lot of service providers that meet that target. AWS does. And, and, it, and we, and we have the metrics to prove it. <laughs> All right, no SQL fundamentals. This is where everything gets hit. The rubber hits the road. How do you use the technology? We talked a lot about, you know, what is the technology? Why is the technology? You know, how does the technology differentiate? When we talk about DynamoDB, when you talk about data modeling and no SQL, 
it's all the same story, right? Nothing's really different. <laughs> uh, despite, like I said, the vendors have all their, you know, hey, we're a document database and we use rich JSON structures, so we're better. No, that's not really true. If you think about NoSQL databases at their core, it's a collection of objects, right? You can call them documents, you can call them items, you can call them whatever you want, but it's it, it's an object that has attributes and those attributes have, you know, in DynamoDB's case, it's called a table. The collection is called, it's called a collection in, in MongoDB. Uh, tables have items, items have attributes. Not all the items have to have all the same attributes. And you can kind of think of these items like all the rows of those relational tables that you have in your relational database. They're just all kind of loaded into the same collection. I, it's not exactly how we might model things in the real world, but it, it helps to kind of think of things this way. Essentially, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm putting all those rows on one table. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to query those. I'm going to create a partition key or a unique ad ID for all of these items that we're sticking in there, documents, items, whatever you want to call it, partition key in DynamoDB, underbar ID in MongoDB, you know, whatever, there's a unique identifier in every NoSQL database. And that supports the key value access pattern we're all so familiar with. Give me the document or the object associated with this value, with this partition key value. Great. The next thing we're going to do with NoSQL database is start indexing these items. <coughs> in DynamoDB and other wide column databases, the table is really your first index. It's just one that you maintain yourself. And we do this by adding what we call a sort key and creating a compound key. So now what we have is a partition key that defines you know, a grouping of objects on the table. We have a sort key that defines a unique object within that partition. And essentially what I've been able to do now is maintain one to many relationships and enable rich query capabilities to give me the ability to filter and sort objects within those partitions, right? Using things like greater than, less than, equals to, betweens, contains, you know, whatnot. So the example here I always like to use at the basic, you know, level is to say, okay, the customer, customer, you know, ID might be a partition key. Sort key might be customer interaction date, you know, concatenated with the interaction ID, right? <clears throat> so kind of date hash ID. And so now what I want is I want the customer, you know, comes in, he logs into his portal. What does he see? He sees all his activity for the last 30 days or so, whatever, 12 months. I query the system. I say query where customer ID equals X. Sort key is greater than, you know, 30 days ago, 12 months ago, whatever it is. I get all of the customer's interactions. And since what we just talked about was I'm sticking all the rows from all the tables in one place. Essentially, I'm grouping them on the customer ID within the partition. I'm sorting them by date. I have essentially joined all these objects into a single partition related to the customer. They could be orders. They could be shipments, invoices, and payments. They could be anything. They could be support interactions. A anything that the customer has interacted with the system could be stored in that partition, date ranged, and retrieved in a single query. So what I've done is I've kind of, again, pre-joined the items into this partition. Now, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to decorate these objects with additional attributes. Those attributes are going to assign uh, indexes to those attributes and essentially regroup these objects into new partitions on the indexes, rejoining them into you know, new interesting groupings that our application will find useful to support its access patterns. And this is the crux of NoSQL, right? NoSQL doesn't you know, it's, it's not that it doesn't have joins, <laughs> it doesn't need joins, right? A join operator in a relational database, it joins indexes across tables. When a NoSQL database stores all those objects on the same table, they all live on the same indexes. If I decorate those items with common attributes, then essentially I've joined them onto the index already, and I'm replacing the join with the index. I always like to say that we're replacing the join with the index. How do we group the objects on in index to, to, to replace the join? And this is what NoSQL data modeling is really all about. So we'll get into what we just described was this, uh, was this concept of called partition overloading. And to be able to make this work, we use generic keys to facilitate these heterogeneous partitions, right? Everything needs to have a PK. Everything needs to have an SK attribute. It be all kinds of different types of items. In this case, we have orders. We have the items from those orders. We have you know, the customer's metadata. And when I query this partition with the select where greater than X, as far as date range goes, I get all of that data from this partition. Anything that has a date range condition that's greater than, you know, my, my, my sort key condition, which includes the customer's metadata, even though it's not an actual date string because, you know, it's a, it's an alphabetic character, which is greater than any numeric in a string sort, right? So we're going to play games with these types of partition keys and sort keys to be able to group these items, sort them, filter them in all you know, various interesting ways, you know, to support our applications access patterns. All right. Secondary indexes. We talked about decorating the items with additional attributes to be able to group them onto these indexes. <coughs> 
when we group these objects onto these indexes, essentially what we're telling DynamoDB is replicate these things. If you're a Cassandra fan, you can think of a GSI like a column family. A column family is a, a regrouping of the items on the in the key space that I actually as a developer have to kind of you know insert the object across multiple column families. In DynamoDB, I'm going to create a GSI instead of a column family, and I'm going to just insert the object on the table and it's automatically going to replicate you know to the indexes. And I'm going to tell the system how much of the object to replicate, right? I maybe only want to replicate the keys because I'm looking for you know uh, objects that match a condition and I don't want to replicate the entire object because it's a big object and you know, I really only want the keys. And then I'll find the objects that match a condition. I'll select one, I'll go get the object, right? Because again, think of it, I'm replicating the item to an index. Essentially, I'm doubling my, you know, if I replicate the entire item, I'm doubling my storage, I'm doubling my write throughput. So if the access pattern on the index doesn't require all of the item, then don't replicate it. You can replicate just the keys, some subset of attributes. You can replicate all of the attributes. It's all up to you, right? What is the access pattern on the GSI? Now, when we use indexes, this is where things really start to get you in NoSQL, right? Because typically what we do is we have a nice, well-distributed access pattern on the table and things get a little more hairy on the index. What does that mean? Well, things work well in NoSQL when we're well spread out, right? In NoSQL, we define this thing called a key space, right? We talked about the partition key. Well, in DynamoDB, we take the partition key value, we hash it, we arbitrarily lay these items out across this logical key space. And when we start to add throughput or capacity, storage capacity to the system, essentially what we're doing is logically separating the key space and partitioning it across many, many different storage nodes. Now, when I query the system, I'm going to give it a partition key value, uh, equality condition, and that's going to tell the request router exactly which partition I need to go to to get your data. And so it doesn't matter if there's a thousand storage nodes on this key space. I give the query. It goes right there. Everybody's happy. Latency is low all the time, consistent at any scale. And this is how all NoSQL databases work. Now, this only works if I'm not nailing too much work to a single partition, right? So if you think about it on the table we just described, customers and giving orders and interactions with the system, you know, a customer partition is never going to see a high velocity of data, right? They're not ordering thousands of orders a second or creating thousands of interactions a second or anything like that. So that's great. That's that, that workload is well spread out across that key space. Now, when we look at the indexes, however, oftentimes this is not the case. So let's talk about that customer scenario. We have customer orders. And if I want to create an index on the source of the order, if you're thinking like Amazon retail, right, I'm going to go, okay, index on location and source. Well, guess what? That's going to be a lot of people ordering all the same time across the entire United States, right? Or maybe I want to go, you know, ASIN by status, right? So, I mean, hey, hot items that are getting ordered on Prime Day, you know, they're going to be ordered a lot hot faster than, you know, 1,000 or two. 2,000 items a second, they could be, you know, tens of thousands of orders per second processing. So, you know, a single storage node can't really handle that much. So how do we spread it out? And we do this by salting those keys, right? So if we're indexing on source, we're indexing on product ID, and we know we need to get, you know, high velocity transactions, then we're going to add some logical number of partitions to spread that data across. And this is fine because typically when we're processing data at that velocity, well, I'm going to consume it in a distributed manner. Manner, right. So if I'm kind of sharding it across multiple containers, that kind of facilitates parallel processing on the read side. So we'll have a data layer API. We'll have a bunch of parallel processors reading across those containers and we'll paginate across the containers uh, to produce the result set when we need it. Right. Uh, so the other thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to use generic keys because I am going to want to overload that index. I want to have as many different types of items, as many different types of access patterns supported by both the table and the index as possible. We'll show you why and how to do this in a second. But the real the, the reason why is that I want to reuse the capacity I allocate to GSI1 across all my access patterns because they don't all fire at the same time, right? I don't want to have to maintain multiple capacity buckets. And if I, if I overload my GSIs, I'm going to be able to uh, more efficiently use the capacity I've allocated. So what does this look like? If you look at all those items laid out now on the on the actual index, when I query the index, well, the partition key and the sort key conditions, they define the types of items that are coming back, right? I'm creating new partition types. In this case, a grouping of orders by you know, source and location, 
right? And, you know, if I query by ASIN, I'm going to get a grouping of, you know, ASIN products by, you know, state of the order, right? Uh, and I'm never going to see overlaps because the key conditions are going to dictate which items I'm querying for. It's really, if you think of the keys on the table, the keys on the index, these are kind of labels, right? Identifiers. How do I find these objects? It's kind of like on the file cabinet. When I open the file cabinet, I skim across the order, the folders, I look inside the folders, I have tabs on my papers, right? Those are the keys. Okay. When I need to work with the item, I'm going to select the item. I'm going to look at the item, but this is how I'm going to find the item. Okay. And I'm going to use those keys to find the item or find the item on the table or how or vice versa. Right. All right. Let's get into some of the, you know, more, uh, you know, interesting aspects of data modeling in NoSQL, which is really about dealing with relational data. Uh, relational data <clears throat> it exists in every application, in every service, in every single you know workload that I have ever touched in my programming career, or I ever worked in, in, at, you know with in my professional career. There's no getting away from relational data, so we don't want to talk about data as non-relational, right? There's no such thing as non-relational data. Social networks, document management, IT monitoring, process control. It doesn't matter what type of application I'm building. There's relationships in the data, and if the database that I'm using cannot represent those relationships efficiently, it's not going to work. Okay, uh, we talk a lot about this at Amazon. Seventy, you know, when we went and looked at, you know, moving from relational database to NoSQL, oh, 70 percent of our access patterns, you know, they fired on a single row of data. You know, another 20 percent only operated on a, a set of data rows from a single table. You know, that, that's great, but what about the other 10 percent? OK, they all got to work and those are all relational patterns. Right. And so that's what we're going to talk about. And how do we actually maintain these relationships? You know, up till now, we use this kind of you know, construct, this relational structure, third normal form. We put the data in homogeneous collections across multiple tables. We create indexes on those tables. We query and we join those indexes, you know, in, in the application tier, uh, not in the application tier, you know, but in the in the database engine. And we and we produce views of the, that data. So this is a simple product catalog. Think of the queries that we might maintain on the left-hand side, normalized. On the right-hand side, you'd say denormalized. Uh, what we've done really is collapse the hierarchy, right? In this case, on the right, it's a simple blob, product items. You know, I would select star from products. I get all my products. On the left, not so easy, right? We got to actually query lots of different tables, lots of different things. So maybe it's easier to go the other route. Let's look at this from a time complexity perspective, right? We've got... Uh, you know, ad hoc joins in SQL across all these tables. Let's put some real data on here and see what happens when we break this down, right? Select star from products, interjoin books. Okay. You know, eh, slight time complexity as we join across two index scans, but it just gets worse from there, right? The more tables we add, the more the time complexity increases. And, you know, for anybody who's done any real work in, in SQL, you're looking at these queries on the left and go, yeah, that's like, you know, rudimentary stuff, right? So when you start adding in, you know, many to many joins, multiple mapping tables across derived tables, boy, the time complexity of building these views of data, it's tremendous. And you can start to see why, uh, you know, the Moore's law was such a friend to the relational database because the only reason this worked, the only reason it ever worked was because the CPU performance just started just flying, right? And, and it didn't matter that storage costs were dropping and they were plummeting, but the CPU performance was increasing faster. Okay. Well, this again stopped in 2014. So what do we look at with no SQL, right? Let's take all of that data that we just looked at. We're going to map all of those rows. Again, I would, this is naive approach. I might not necessarily model the data this way but it gives you an idea. What is the time complexity, the efficiency of the NoSQL query versus the relational query? Okay, that one-to-one -one join, you know, I could put two items in this partition, but they were tiny little items. I just joined them together and put them on one item inside of the, the book partition, select where book title equals X. I've got a time complexity, O log N. It's a simple index scan. You know, hey, it never gets worse, right? In DynamoDB's case, I'm always going to execute an index scan in a perfectly, you know, in a theoretically, you know, perfect implementation of NoSQL as a distributed hash table. It would be time complexity would be constant. I mean, what the heck, right? I mean, it's bottom line is I, I don't have to execute these, you know, joins across indexes. I'm essentially scanning all my items out the same index. So I'm, I'm eliminating the time complexity. Now, when we get into the many to many join, right? When we're looking at movies and actors, right? Now all of a sudden we've got some choices to make. This is where denormalization really comes into play. As I, as I start to load those actors edge items from that mapping table into the movie partition here, I'm actually going to denormalize some of the actors, you know, uh, information, the gender, the birth date, you know, things that are immutable, easy to denormalize, right? Storage is cheap. CPU is expensive. If you denormalize immutable data, you can never pay the price. There's never pr a price to pay. There's only, there's only, you know, uh, 
uh, uh, cost gained, right? Even if it's data that changes, if it's a relatively low velocity, you know, DynamoDB gives you streams and Lambda to be able to maintain denormalized, you know, data, which is really cool because most of those denormalized updates, they're idempotent. So you don't even have to worry about duplicate Lambda executions. Just, you know, please clobber all the copies, right? Things like that. Now, in this case, I've created a graph, a directed graph. The movie knows about the actors that are in it, what roles they played, whatnot. Uh, but, you know, the actor doesn't know about what movies he's been in because we didn't really connect the actor to the movie yet. So okay, for that IMDB use case, which is kind of look at the movie, now go get the actor's information, see what other movies he's been in. I would actually need to create an index. And DynamoDB, one of the ways to do that, which is really cool, is to look at the other side of many, many relationships is just flip your keys, right? We've got, you know, flip the sort key to the partition key for the GSI, flip the partition key to the sort key, and we've enabled a new set of access patterns, right? Select star where SK equals author name, brings back all the books for a given author, select by song title for a PK uh, of the GSI PK, then we get all of the uh, uh, albums that the song has appeared on, all the tracks of, that have been recorded for that song. Uh, select by the actor's name. Hey, guess what? Now we're seeing the other side of that many-to-many -many relationship. This is an undirected graph. In this case, I haven't really denormalized any of the movie data to these edges, but I could with well, things, you know, so that when I'm in this view for the actor, I have things like maybe, you know, the two second summary of the movie. What was it about? Who was the, you know, the director, excuse me, uh, things like that. Uh, but it gives me some information about, uh, you know, what the other side is. And so this is how you kind of look at denormalization in an OSQL data modeling scenario. It's like, okay, is it a directed graph? Is it an undirected graph? If it's a directed graph, then the only thing I need to do is denormalize the data from one side. If it's an undirected graph, well, there might be bits and pieces of data that I want to denormalize from both sides, uh, so on and so forth, right? Which which direction does that, 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 that many to many, which side of the many to many is the access pattern coming from? Uh, does it come from one side or the other? If it comes from both sides, it's undirected. If it's, it comes from one side, it's directed. So there you go. So that's those are the only choices you need to make when you talk about denormalization. Again, select by director name, get all the movies for a director, select by musician, get all the albums that a musician has produced. Uh, and the, the, the combinations are endless. As you add new indexes, new attributes to new items, new different types of partitions on the table, as you can start to see, there's nothing that prevents you from maintaining every single relationship that you're used to doing it all in one table with multiple entity types using you know these generic keys right i mean it's a it's a very easy way to start laying data out once you kind of get your head around it right <clears throat> all right complex queries these are the things where we look at no sql no sql databases start to break down a little bit uh, we have uh, no ability to run efficiently run you know complex aggregations calculations you know counts sums averages computed kpis top end last end these are things that are hard on on no sql databases but guess what they were kind of hard on relational databases too and a lot of applications i mean it's funny i was just talking i talked to some major companies the major social media customer we had the other day they were telling me about how they have uh, you know count aggregation tables they have a service i we actually had a service we built internally at amazon Amazon, which which actually spawned this design pattern, which is, hey, you know what? I don't need to worry about computing the aggregation if I can maintain it, right? Maintain it in real time. As the data events hit the table, DynamoDB has this thing called DynamoDB streams, right? All those write events are going to trigger Lambda functions, which can then create real-time aggregations and write that data right back to the table as summary items. So if you have operational analytics, right? Summary reports and aggregations that you need to know in real time. Uh, you know, this is a, this is a basically an eventually consistent aggregation framework that scales you know, in, in, to any, any level, right? There's no real time computation happening here. I'm maintaining buckets and counters and computed KPIs on the fly. And it's a pretty lightweight operation to maintain a running average uh, versus, you know, trying to compute that average on every call against a billion items, right? Um, the other things people do, they push that data into open search service for higher level indexing functions that we don't support in DynamoDB. If you have full text indexing, uh, geospatial indexing, or you have queries that require complex inter inter index intersections, you know, we can, we can pipe data into Elasticsearch. And what's great about this streams Lambda interaction is it's guaranteed execution. So you don't have to worry about container failures. You know, it's going to happen. It's guaranteed at least once. It's going to happen in order by item. Uh, so these are, you know, just excellent. It's an excellent service for doing lightweight updates. We'll talk a little bit about what that means when I talk about lightweight in a second. Uh, one of the best use cases for Lambda is piping that chain stream into Kinesis Firehose, uh, loading it into S3 as parquet files, 
And now it's available for historical audit trail queries with Amazon Athena. And you have full ad hoc query support against that historical data. And this is probably the, I I would say 90% of the time, if not more, this is the reason why people have to use the relational database because the NoSQL database fits every access pattern, except, oh, you know, my support guys have to come in every now and then and research on this ticket or somebody needs to run, you know, a, 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 you know, a monthly report and who knows what the, what the execs are going to ask for, you know, by able, being able to pump your raw data and the chain stream out into Kinesis Firehose and into S3, you, you can support those queries because those aren't really low latency, high velocity queries, right? You, you pay for those queries when you run them. Yeah, sure. If I'm, if I'm querying petabytes of data, it's going to take a couple hundred milliseconds, maybe even a couple seconds for the Athena query to come back. But, you know, who cares if I'm, if it's a support ticket and I'm working a case, I don't care if it takes me five seconds to get the data. If I'm querying, you know, uh, uh, petabytes, a hundred petabytes of data, uh, it, it, it'll, you know, I, I just want the answer. Right. And that's really what it comes down to uh, for supporting those types of audit trail historical you know, queries. That's where you see most of your OLAP style workload. Right. And so it's kind of funny because DynamoDB sure doesn't support it very well, but Athena absolutely does. And if you don't have high velocity, low latency query requirements there, which most OLAP workloads are not, uh, then this satisfies 100 percent of your access patterns right here. So DynamoDB is really powerful that way. All right. Uh, thing about streams and Lambda that we need to be uh, very well aware of is the fact that, you know, the amount of processing those Lambda functions are doing is going to, it could slow down the stream processing, right? The stream shards themselves, they kind of scale with your table. Uh, the table gets, as we talked about, distributed across a large number of storage nodes. You know, the Lambda processors eventually will scale up to one to one, right? One Lambda processor for each one of your storage nodes. Uh, now, you know, at, at low velocity, then you're going to spread multiple storage nodes into a single Lambda, you know, processor. But, you know, the streams uh, infrastructure scales with your table. Now, the processing of the data on the streams is restricted by the amount of processing your Lambda functions can execute in real time. So if you have a heavyweight process, right, if I'm like, hey, let me get this data, maintain this aggregation, shove it into Firehose, those are pretty lightweight operations. But, oh, now I need to hit this external API and get a confirmation of a downstream processor. And if you're doing that on every item, then what's going to happen is your iterator age is going to start to back up. The currency of the data that's processing through Lambda is going to start to age. The consistency is going to start to drift. And eventually, if it's too long, you're going to exceed that 24-hour window and you're going to start seeing data fall off the back of the stream, right? So you get one knob to adjust this. You get currency or parallelization of the Lambda function. You get up to five Parallel instances processing from each stream shard. But, you know, my advice to most people is don't do heavy processing on your Lambda stream, you know, on the Lambda functions that are processing the stream. If you need heavy processing, like I said, downstream acknowledgement of third party processing of your data, then push that into a SQS instance or, you know, call an API gateway and hand it off or do something, but don't, don't process it on the stream shard. Uh, or, you know, you'll end up risk, you risk backing up and, and at the worst, you know, most of the time what you see here is you see the consistency drift, right? Uh, Lambda processing is typical one to two seconds. If you, if you're not processing your data efficiently, you can see that efficiency drift, you know, the consistency drift, you know, to whatever your iterator age might be. You know, is it hours? It could be hours old, right? So you don't want stale data, especially on those aggregation functions. So, so don't slow your stream processors down. All right. So we just talked about, we talked about a whole ecosystem of, of processing infrastructure, you know, for your application. It's not just database anymore, right? It's a complete data processing platform. Uh, the front end, uh, you know, is the serverless app, right? API gateway, APS, you know, AWS Lambda, you know, backed by DynamoDB, but you throw streams into the mix and now, that data can fork out to anything, anywhere. You know, we just talked about all those workflows, S3, Athena, Amazon OpenSearch, you know, back to DynamoDB, uh, run those operational analytics and aggregations. Uh, again, this is no longer just a database. This is a complete data processing engine with guaranteed execution on the chain stream. And you can start to build application workloads around all of this plumbing. And, and I'm seeing people do it. And it's what's most exciting about working with DynamoDB is not even the database anymore. It's what people are doing with it as a processing engine, right? All right, let's get into, you know, modeling relational data. This is looking at real world applications. This is where we want to break it down to, okay, I've got, yeah, I understand all that, Rick. That was great. You know, that sounds good. Now, how do we do it? Here's my application. And this is where I actually rubber hits the road when you get into design reviews with the customers and they're talking to you about, you know, here's my ERD, here's my access patterns. How do I model my data, right? And how do I make it work? 
In DynamoDB, this is exactly the process we go through. Uh, it's the same process you go through with the relational database. We define that into the relationship diagram, and I have to understand what data lives where and what the relationships are between that data. In this case, we're looking at an employee portal service. Uh, we have employees file time cards on projects. They open tickets. They you know, you have messages on those tickets. Some employees might manage those tickets and whatnot, be assigned to those tickets. Uh, they, they create meetings. They file, they open up their, you know, they create meetings in buildings and, and, and invite other people to those meetings. And there's a whole set of access patterns that we're going to identify around this application service, right? So the application, typically, this is what you're going to see in the NoSQL development environment is, you know, we're going to define the ERD, we're going to list the access patterns. Now, in a relational database, I might not list the access patterns first, right? I might, you know, just go ahead and start writing user stories. Honestly, your user stories define your access patterns. So you kind of need those before you have your access patterns. But, uh, you know, with the entity relationship diagram, in a, in a relational database, I can define the, cat, the the DDL that's needed to build that database catalog, right? I can define my tables. I can add mapping tables between the many-to-many -many relationships of those entities. And I've got 90% of what I need to build the data model. In in a NoSQL database, you haven't even started. You just started when you got that that together. Now I've got the first piece. The next piece is the access patterns, right? What are the user stories? What are the access patterns required to support those user stories and just kind of reduce it to, okay, I need to get these entities on these dimensions, you know, uh, based on in this range, right? And so this is what you do. And in this case, we find 23 different access patterns that we need to support for this data. Uh, in DynamoDB, then we're going to start doing is starting to define the partitions on the table, loading items into those partitions and selecting some subset of access patterns from this list that the table itself will support. OK, so in this example, we broke it down. <clears throat> We've got nine access patterns that are supported on the table using four partition types. We have a building partition. We have an employee partition. We have a project partition and we have ticket partitions. Okay. And so these are the access patterns that we would support. And what you're seeing here is how we'd slice through these partitions using key conditions and filter conditions to satisfy the specific access patterns. In this case, get meetings by employee ID, right? Select by PK as employee ID, sort key between date one and day two. Uh, uh, you know, get meetings by building. You know, this is an interesting workflow here. It kind of demonstrates how we might leverage Lambda, right? If somebody creates a meeting in a building, well, first off, when someone goes to create a meeting in a building, they need to know which rooms are available. So the first thing they'll do is they'll select the room metadata for the building, which has all the rooms in a single item. It says, here's all the rooms. And then they're going to select a time that they want to reserve their meeting for. And it's going to show the rooms that are reserved during that time frame, right? Like this day. Okay, give me all the rooms that are reserved in this building on this day. Uh, and that, then I can fill out the calendar UI component on my on my user interface, right? And then you can select your user. You can select your thing. You can create your meeting. When you create the meeting, you drop that item inside of the building partition. Lambda picks that up, replicates it to the employee partition so that every employee who's invited has one of these. Whenever that parent meeting item gets updated, you know, change the time, change the date, change the subject, whatever, change the, the, the meeting dial in. Guess what Lambda does? It picks it up. It looks at the attendee list. It propagates those changes to all of those employee partitions. Hey, so we can then reflect those changes in those employee you know, uh, uh, lookups, right? Again, this is all we're doing is selecting by different dimensions, different conditions. And as we do this, we're kind of ex we're, we're extending the table to uh, that we of our access patterns to include the key conditions and the filter conditions that we need to you know define the query that we're running to get what we want, right? And so all of these conditions can be supported, all of these queries can be supported by slicing and uh, through these partitions on different dimensions. Uh, and then at some point, what we've done is we said, okay, these are all the types of items that we're going to stick on the table. And for all these types of items, we've identified a single access pattern supported by the table. But many of these items, they actually have multiple access patterns, right? We like we said, we're going to decorate these items with additional, you know, attributes that we're going to index to support, you know, more groupings, right? So we got nine of our twenty-three patterns are supported on the table. Well, I've got, you know. 14 more access patterns. So which of these items have a second dimension? And that's exactly what we're going to do. Okay, for GSI 1, we're going to add those to the items that need to be indexed on more than one dimension. And so, and at least two dimensions. In this case, we've got, you know, multiple different types of partitions. We have email partitions on, and we have, you know, state partitions for projects. Uh, when we query by uh, email, we're going to get that dashboard view, right? Date ranged items inside of a customer and kind of employees partitioned by email. It gives us the ability to populate a landing page or a home page. Give me everything that's greater than 30 days ago. You know, and it gives me everything that I, that the employee has in their partition. 
one of the things to point out here is the liberal use of filter conditions in these use cases. And if you think about it, filter conditions are uh, not necessarily the most efficient way to query data in DynamoDB because what happens is I read the data and I charged based on the sort key condition. I'm then going ahead and receive the items that match the filter condition. So I'm paying to read the items maybe all items that I'm not necessarily returning. But in this case, that's okay because these are relatively small items. Uh, together, they're gonna be one or two RCU. If I filter out a few items, it's not gonna hurt me. So those filter conditions are actually really, really valuable because they avoid the need to create additional indexes, right? Whenever I can use a filter condition, I can do it efficiently, uh, then, then do it. Because you know, creating an index sometimes isn't the right answer. All right, so again, we're going to support additional nine access patterns on this table. As you can see, again, slicing through those partitions to satisfy the various you know, access patterns, get ticket history by email, get projects by status, start, target date, uh, liberal use of filter conditions here because we've got generally small partitions. We're not going to be reading through and filtering out you know, large, large chunks of, of data. Uh, and, and even if we are filtering, if we, even if we are reading through large chunks of data, if the filter is not highly selective, that's okay too. If I'm just throwing out an item, every couple items, every couple hundred that I scan, then that's, that's absolutely a great use of a filter condition, right? So don't be afraid of filter conditions. I see a lot of people shy away from those because they're trying to get, you know, elegant sorts. Uh, but, you know, sometimes you don't need that. <clears throat> um, look at the next index. Now all of a sudden we're dropping in the number of access patterns that we're supporting and we're dropping in the number of items. You know, why? Because not all those items need to be accessed on three dimensions. Some of them only needed actually to be accessed on one. If you notice, GSI-1 was, you know, less less items on GSI-1 than on the table. Because some of the items on the table, they only had one access pattern. Same thing for GSI-2, right? Fewer access patterns, you know, fewer uh, uh, items that are projecting to GSI-2. And again, out to GSI-3, even fewer items matching on those patterns. GSI-3 now supports three and why do I need three GSIs? Because, well, these items have three access patterns, right? So I need them on the table. I need them on, this item actually has four. I need it on the table. I need it on G, on all three GSIs. Uh, and so that's why this, this item is, you know, extended out across all indexes. And as we get to the, you know, the end, this is what we're going to deliver, right? As through the design, you know, exercise completes, we're going to have a chart, which is going to have all of our access patterns. It's going to have the table or the index in which we're querying. It's going to define the key conditions, the filter conditions. And if you look at Amazon internal teams, they all have a wiki that has something that looks like this and something that, you know, defines the model of the table uh, with all the various objects on it. And, you know, this way they can, you know, pass on to the next generation, so to speak, of the work that they've done. Now, a lot of times people talk a little bit about, well, what happens if I add new access patterns to this list, right? And, and it's like, well, you know, I mean, it's kind of the same thing with the relational database, right? I mean, one of the biggest problems we had at Amazon, which drove us to NoSQL, was schema updates, right? When you update the schema, and if you can't put a default value of like null in there, you know, hey, those large tables took a long time to update, right? And and it wasn't always something I could do with the database online. Uh, it's the same consideration with NoSQL. If I need to update the items on the table. You can look at it and say, well, is this something I can do as a lazy update? When I read the items, modify the schema and write back. Do I need to do a table scan and write back? Do I need to add new attributes to existing items? Do I need to, you know, add uh, uh, a new index? You know, a lot of times what's interesting with DynamoDB is you can do really cool things like, you know, hey, if I need to, you know, do a table scan write back, operation to modify, you know, all the items on the table or some subset of items on the table, you can stand up a temporary GSI and, and scan the GSI, use the exact same keys as the table and let that GSI come online. And you can table scan the GSI without impacting the operational you know, throughput of the table, and then only the right operations, the actual update operations to the items that you're scanning out the GSI, those are the only, you know, uh, hit on the table space. So uh, this is one of the nice things about having a fully distributed, you know, shared backplane service like DynamoDB is you have access to all of these, uh, you know, knobs to turn, so to speak, when you need them. You want to export the data to another table? Here all the time, people talk about lock-in with DynamoDB, right? Uh, you're not locked in when you can move the data out as fast as you want, right? Do you want 10 million RCU so you can export this data through a fire hose into any other cloud provider? AWS will do that for you. So uh, try and do that with your legacy NoSQL technology, right? When you're provisioned for peak utilization and you want to migrate to a different platform, good luck with that. You're going to have to, you know, 
take that whole thing offline and go into a hard maintenance window. Anyways, uh, can, not that you wouldn't with Dynamo, but you, I think you get the point. The idea here is, you know, NoSQL is not about non-relational data, right? NoSQL is about relational data. All data is relational and we care about it. The ERD still matters. Uh, and relational database may not be deprecated by NoSQL, but now that Moore's law is not helping it out anymore, believe me, it's fading fast. And this era of distributed SQL, that's just somebody putting crutches under it. Bottom line is, now, increasing the time complexity of the query is not the answer when Moore's law is not helping you, you know, in that storage compute balance, right? You're just going to fall further and further behind, even with distributed SQL. It's just, it's, it's not going to get you where you need to go. No SQL is a great fit for OLTP. If you need high velocity OLAP, RDBMS can be a really good fit. But like I said, when you have the, you know, those long running historical aggregations, historical queries, things like that, you know, hey, we can run those in Athena as well. So, you even look at NoSQL for some of those OLAP workloads that you might not have thought it was a good fit for. Uh, all right, that's what I've got for you guys today. Thanks so much again. My name is Rick Houlihan. And hit me up on Twitter if you're uh, interested in anything I talk about. I do a lot of uh, design reviews for some of our more strategic customers. So if you work for a larger company and you're interested in having a NoSQL day, feel free to reach out to your rep. They can hit me up and we can set something up you know, for your team. Uh, thanks so much. And please remember to uh, complete that session survey. All right, thank you.